Tonight's scripture will be taken from Matthew, chapter 12, verses 33 through 37. Matthew 12, 33 37. I'll be reading from the New American Standard. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak of what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out his evil treasure that is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they will give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by the, your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Well, good evening. It's good to be out with so many of you. Certainly thankful for the opportunity of our West Mason family here to come together again on the Lord's Day to open His Word and to learn together the ways that he would call us to live. And if you haven't guessed already from the last song that Brother John led us in and from the scripture reading, we're going to be talking about taming the tongue this evening. It's up there, good. So when we talk about taming the tongue, I think normally when we think about this, or if you were asked for a lesson or think about scriptures that talk about this topic, we talk a lot about what we say, kind of the content of our language, so to speak. The things that make sense for us to speak, the things that are becoming of a Christian, and the things that we stay away from. Tonight, I want to kind of develop that idea a little bit more, though, because just as important of what we say is how we say it. And I don't think there's a better passage, at least in my mind, than Proverbs 27 and verse 14. Whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud voice rising early in the morning will be counted as cursing. Now you could envision this, and this is kind of like an episode of a sitcom maybe, where somebody's waking somebody up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and they're next door neighbors, and it's a humorous image, right? Until we realize that the deeper truth here that the proverb tells us is that our words carry weight far beyond just what's being said, but how we say it, when we say it, and to whom we're speaking. There's a lot to appreciate and learn in this one little proverb. And so I want to unpack Proverbs 27, 14, and look at these three ways that we can tame the tongue. First off being how we speak. You and I need to appreciate the impact that that really carries in how we say what we say. In this proverb, it's the idea that what is being said here is with a loud voice. And so being early in the morning is uh, certainly not the time that you would probably choose. If you're like me, you don't like the loud alarm clock, you'd like to at least start off a little bit softer. But the fact of the matter is what's being said in this proverb is good. It's a blessing. Consider this. You might be saying a blessing, something good, but if you say it the wrong way, it will be counted as cursing because of the way that you say it. That should give us pause to think about this. The way I say things, even if it's meant to be good, can actually cause the exact opposite reaction. We see that in the proverb here, and I don't think I'm saying anything new to you all because you probably have experienced this at some point in your lives, where the way that you say something, how you speak, ends up coming out differently than, well, I meant to say this, and I did say this, but... The impact was different. You know, a lot of this will come down to nonverbals. And even though right there in the name it's not verbal, they actually say a whole lot. This goes from anywhere from your tone and your voice when you're saying something to your posture, how you're holding yourself, or your facial expression, the way you're looking when you say something. 
This all comes down to the way we communicate. And yes, even in our technology-advanced world, when we're text messaging one another, I still will have no idea what those three dot, dot, dot means for every individual person when we're texting back and forth. For some people, it just means they're thinking. For some people, they just really have to hit those last three buttons, dot, 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 to end a text. Or what about this? Have you ever been talking with somebody over a messaging system and you get okay? What, what does that mean, okay? What if it's just okay, a y versus okay? Is there a difference there? What if it's okay, a y dot, dot, dot? What is happening? We all experience this. Or what if it's the okay emoji? Like, there's so many different ways that we can communicate, and whether we're intending it or not, they all might have very slightly or very big impacts on the people we're communicating with, both in giving and receiving. So what does this all have to do with, with God? Well, as we just sang about, as disciples of the Lord, we need to be mindful about how we're using our words. And we are called to use our words wisely so that no matter who we're talking to, we're representing him to the world. If you turn to Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 15, it's a very quick verse, but it talks about the attitude with which we are to speak. It's all well and good if we're saying, I'm going to speak the truth, I'm going to devote myself to the truth, and that's awesome, that's something we need to be devoted to. Just as important is how we are going to present that truth. Ephesians 4, 15, we're going to speak the truth. How? Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. We can speak the truth, but with an attitude that actually undermines it. You see, when we speak the truth, we need to be a faithful representative, certainly of the truth, but also of the love of the one who is the author of all truth taking into consideration how we are addressing, not at the expense of the truth, certainly not, but with an intent to faithfully represent the truth and to speak to people's hearts, truly coming from a place of love. And so we see here that attitude has a big impact in the words that we speak. And Jesus will, out, will address this as well in the verses that were read for us. By John just a few minutes ago in Matthew chapter 12 verses 35 through 37 in particular the good person out of his good treasure brings forth good and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil I tell you on the day of judgment people will give account for every careless word they speak for by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned how often do you just speak without thinking. I mean, that's the definition of careless, isn't it? Not giving thought to what my words might actually sound like to the other person, let alone how I'm saying, when I'm saying it, all these different things we're talking about might actually impact them in this moment where they are right now. And so Jesus says, when we're careless with our words, it reveals something about our heart. And that doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes and we can't correct those things but his point here is that when we have hearts that are set on God, we're going to take every thought captive to Christ. And if we're taking every thought captive, the words that spring from those thoughts will be taken captive to be representative of our Lord and Savior as well. How often do we speak carely? For me, too much. And so this is a place where I need to grow, and I don't think I'm alone in that. So as we strive to tame our tongue, let's consider certainly what we are speaking, but also how we are speaking. Part of that is included in when we choose to speak. Going back to Proverbs 17, or 27 and verse 14, notice that the proverb says that this loud blessing is pronounced early in the morning. Look, the blessing's good, and maybe it's something that somebody wants to shout out from the rooftops because it's such a great thing. You got the timing all wrong, right? That's not exactly when you want that volume, as we've already discussed. 
Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 7, in the context of Ecclesiastes 3, talking about there's a time and a purpose for everything under heaven, verse 7 will particularly say, there is a time to keep silent and a time to speak. Man, how often do I get those opposite? When it's a time to be silent, I want to run my mouth. And when it's a time to speak, I clam up and I get too shy or too self-conscious too embarrassed we got to learn as God's people how to do both of these when is the time for me to keep silent to think when is the time for me to speak up we must learn to do both because too often we're doing one when we should be doing the other by matter of virtue though when we speak comes down to the fact that we need to listen first. Speaking must always be preceded by an understanding of a desire to hear and to understand. This is what James will write about, inspired by God's Spirit. In James 1 and verse 19, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. You see, we're quick to hear. That's the first thing that we need to be doing. And then we're slow to speak. We're listening, not just giving a person the chance to talk so that once they're done and the noise has stopped, I can start talking, but an actual desire to understand, to give thought to what's being said, and to seek to understand as best as we can before presenting our words. And if you had any doubt that the when we speak had any matter or weight on this subject, if you go back into Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29, there's this interesting phrase that's used when it's discussing how we use our tongues. And it comes down to timing, specifically the occasion in which we find ourselves speaking. Ephesians 4, 29, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who... Who hear. So we're mindful of many things when we're taming our tongues, when we're reigning in the words that we're saying. Part of it is understanding there's a time and a place for these things. And what's the occasion here? What situation do I find myself in? And how can I speak best in this moment to be a light of love and truth and service to the people around me? No matter what situation it is or what occasion it is, Notice the underlying current that needs to be behind when we speak. We need to give thought to it, and it needs to be upbuilding and full of grace. My words are not meant from a disciple of Christ standpoint to destroy other people's spirits, but to build them up and to show this unearned favor toward them as an example of God's favor to all. The occasion matters, brothers and sisters, and so we need to be paying attention and taming our tongue when it comes to when we speak. And lastly, I want to talk about this idea of whom we are speaking with. Who are we speaking with? In the proverb, again, Proverbs 27, 14, it's a neighbor. Now, maybe if this was somebody who was from far away out of town and they showed up in the dead of night and they hadn't seen each other for years and they made this loud blessing, maybe then the attitude would have been different, right? Oh, this is awesome. I mean, you live next door, really? You couldn't have waited like five hours to tell me this? Is how it plays through in my head. This comes down to understanding the relationship between people as words are passed between us. What kind of relationship or credibility do you have when you're speaking to other people? Whether it's a relative, somebody in your home, whether it's a co-worker, whether it's somebody who's a Christian, whether it's somebody who is lost and needs Jesus, whether it's somebody who's older, whether it's somebody who's younger, all these things and more factor in to thinking about who I am speaking to when I say my words. You know, the same words coming from different people can be received immensely differently. And by the same token, 
The same person can use different ways or who they're speaking to to make a huge impact. Jesus demonstrates this amazingly. When he's talking to those who are lost in sin and the way he's so gentle with the woman at the well and the woman caught in adultery and the people who are caught up in sin and he's calling them gently. And then the Pharisees, who quite frankly should have known better from their educated, privileged positions in society, he prescribes woes unto them. It's a little different approach when it comes to our language, right? But this is the Son of God. He shows us who we're speaking with makes an impact on how we use our words. Before we go any farther, I do want to bring up this point as a matter of discussing gossip and slander. We need to view ourselves as God's people as caretakers of others' reputations. How often do you go into the office and you start complaining about your spouse to somebody? You're not being a caretaker of their reputation. How often do you speak poorly about your parents to your friends? Nobody's perfect. But understanding that our words carry weight and who we're talking with determines who we're talking about, or it should, at least. God does not want his people to be busybodies or gossips because we are caretakers of each other's reputations. We're mindful about how we can address issues directly, not talking about other people behind their back, but dealing again in truth and love with people in a direct manner. If you turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 4, As we're thinking of ourselves as caretakers, as we're thinking about the different impact we can have on so many different people in our lives with how we're speaking and when we're speaking, who we're speaking with will influence those factors greatly. Colossians 4 and verse 6 says, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. And so we're seasoning to taste here. Again, this is not about changing the truth or tweaking the truth to say something different. In the attitude and the way that I am talking to people and the things that I bring up, knowing how to address each person means that I'm thinking about life from their perspective. I'm putting myself in their shoes and I'm having a heart of compassion like Jesus to actually think about the best way that I can show them that God loves them, that I care about them. And that might be slightly different depending on who you're talking to. And so we season our words with salt to taste. At the end of all of this, if you turn to James chapter 3, regardless of who we are speaking with, the principle at hand is this. No matter who it is, you are speaking to an image bearer of your father. Even if they don't believe that. You are speaking to somebody made in the image of Almighty God. This is James' point when he talks about our words in James 3. This is where the phrase, the idea of taming the tongue, comes from. And if you pick up here, beginning in verse 6, for context, the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. This principle that he lays out. It's easy to say, well, I'm going to bless God, I'm going to speak highly of God, but then you're going to go and say something poor about somebody who's created in his image, that you're cursing them, you're speaking ill of them. Not saying that they're perfect, not saying that they don't have things to work on. This is a matter of principle. No matter who I am talking to, they bear the image of God, and God desires a relationship with them. Are my words and the way that I'm delivering them evidence to that fact? That God cares so much about them, that I care so much about them, 
that I want them to know this great God whose image that they are bearing. What does that yield in my life? Patience. Maybe a little bit of an understanding of that quick to hear and slow to speak mentality. And at the end of the day, what James says here is true. On our own, no being, no human being can tame the tongue. It's this restless evil. It's the easiest way, seemingly, for us to fall short of God's glory. But because of what God does for us, when it's God who's influencing us, as he goes on in chapter 3, when it's God's wisdom influencing when I speak, how I speak, to whom I'm speaking with, it is transformational. And it's by his strength that I can rein in my words and use them not to destroy, but to build up and to glorify my great maker. Let's keep Christ in our hearts this week and this month and the rest of this year down through life. Certainly in what we say, but also in how we say it, when we say it, and to whom we say it. I'm struck by the fact, thinking about the power of the tongue this evening as we looked at God's word together about this subject, some of the most powerful words that you could ever utter bring about salvation. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. The words you speak can bring life or death, and in this instance are part of God's scheme of redemption. His plan for you to, out of the abundance of your heart, confess Jesus as your Lord are, again, the most powerful words you could ever utter to truly mean them. To have the heart that's talked about here in Romans 10. A heart that, as Romans has already covered up till this point in the letter, that turns away from sin, and a heart that is born again in gospel-revealed baptism back in chapter 6 of this very same letter. So don't be thinking that it's just about saying words and I'm saved. Jesus says, out of the abundance of our hearts, our words come out. And that that same abundance is going to influence what I'm doing and the trust and the action that's put forth in serving God. Have you done those things? Do you need to use your words tonight to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, is your Lord and Savior, and that you are in desperate need of him to claim the rich gift of the gospel and to repent from sin and be buried with him in baptism so that you can be washed clean and be rising up as a new creation in his family. And if you've done these things and our discussion tonight from God's word has made you think that you need prayers or encouragement, certainly please let us know that. Remember one another in your prayers this week. Think about one another and how we can support one another and encourage each other might be as simple as a text dot 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 or no dot 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 your words can make a difference in the life of your brother and sister this week in the life of somebody that you will encounter it's up to us how we're going to use them but if there's anything that you need right now please do not wait if it's asking a question let us know if it's you need to obey the gospel let us know it can be right now as we sing or whether we're back in the back later but please don't leave here if you have a need But if it's right now, come forward while we stand and sing.